Welcome to the HR Think Tank, a podcast that uncovers the power a trusted workforce has on team performance, culture and morale. We gather insights from experts, business leaders and HR professionals to help you lead your team. Here's your host, Kai No, CEO and co-founder of Verify Now. The battle for talent is heating up and employees need to step up their game. It's no longer as simple as posting a job and expecting to have a high quality applicant pool. On today's episode, we'll discuss how you create an awesome candidate experience, essential attraction strategies, and the best places to advertise your available roles. We'll also talk about how you create an attractive offer, tips on negotiating compensation, and why onboarding and offboarding is important for employee retention. Our guest is Paul Din, Head of Sales for Career One, a leading digital employment brand offering a unique job hunting experience and innovative corporate solutions for candidate sourcing, talent management, and employer branding. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks, Kai. Thanks for having me. Let's start with uh, talking about recruitment trends and what you've noticed, you know, in terms of the changes since you started. Because you've been a people manager, you've been in the recruitment and employment space for almost 10 years now. Yep. What are you noticing that's, that's different? Well, I think we're heading more into a digital age and technology is taking over. In my experience, when I did agency recruitment, I was in a more transactional game. I was doing labor hire for a company that focused on construction and trades. So it wasn't about long tenure. It wasn't about, I guess, finding the right people. It was finding people who were skilled enough, had the right qualifications, had the right work experience. And a lot of that was done over the telephone. And nowadays, I'd say... the Platforms like LinkedIn, where it's the most powerful professional social network, is the starting point for a lot of businesses, whether it be recruitment or even sales. So technology has gotten to a point where people aren't making phone calls. They're trying to use things to streamline the process. And we're in a market right now where people will say it's talent poor or talent short at the moment. Um, I have my own thoughts about that specific topic. But what people are trying to find is the right people. And it's not necessarily just what's on paper, right? Mm. They're trying to find ways to, I guess, find the right people and not have to make phone calls, do all that screening. They're trying to do that more efficiently from the get-go. That's what I'm noticing. I want to learn about um, creating a great candidate experience because, you know, the, the, the game, the recruitment space mm-hmm. has changed. Um, employees need to do more to get good talent. Yes. What other important factors to consider when you want to create a great candidate experience? I would say it's essential to have a fleshed out HR process to make sure that it's not just done on a whim, that you know that you will have processes in place for how many interviews are necessary, how the interviews are going to be structured, how they're going to be communicated with. I think the number one thing all candidates want is to feel comfortable and confident. They want to feel like they know what the next stage is, what's going to happen Mm -hmm. next. I think the number one thing we receive in terms of feedback is they feel upset that they've done a great interview, they just don't know why they were never contacted or just informed that they weren't successful, Mm -hmm. which is probably one of the things a lot of talent acquisition managers are guilty of. It's just a lot of work, especially if there are hundreds of applicants. And if there's no automation in process to reach out to 100 people. So you need to make sure that you're representing your company to the best light because that is something that comes back to a lot of companies. You know, in my perspective, how you treat um, your candidates before they come in says a lot about how you treat them once once they do join your team. Of course. And it also impacts your employer brand. Yes. Right? Because word gets around like these these talent will say, oh, my God, company X that hired me, uh, well, sorry, interviewed me. I thought I did amazing. They never even got back to me. And then, you know, in the future, they're in different roles that can impact that relationship. I agree. And I've spoken to many companies where that is their number one concern. There are companies that want to use Career One, for example. And one of our products that we offer doesn't allow them to have access to all the candidates that apply unless there is a paywall that stops them from that. Mm. And they've said, this isn't a product that works for me purely because I can't contact all the unsuccessful applicants unless I pay money for that. So that is a piece, that employer brand, uh, the company brand, um, and how that candidate experiences things. Um, One of the things I pride myself on is anyone who I bring into the fold at Career One, I hire for the sales team. Mm. Uh, As an ex-recruiter, it's just natural for me to (laughs) take care of that for the company. But I make sure every single person that I speak to 
or that comes through the doors knows what they're getting themselves into, that they're as informed as possible. And I try to be as transparent about that, including what every single next step is, that timelines are met. When it comes to recruitment, when should an organization consider using a recruitment agency Mm -hmm. versus keeping the recruitment in-house and doing it themselves? Well, I'd say to that question, if resources are unlimited, do both. Obviously, engaging a recruitment agency doesn't cost you anything off the bat. Very often, the fees are allocated once you've accepted the candidate. You've said, this is a quality candidate. It's someone I want to pay for. That's the agreement. So if resources and costs are not a factor, do both. It, again, falls upon how strong your own internal recruitment processes are as well, your own resources that you have, how big the team is, how fleshed out the processes are. Using Career One as an example, we have a lot of tools at our fingertips. Yeah, it naturally. Is, a lot of my team are ex-recruiters themselves, so we have a lot of expertise and we have access to a lot of candidates. So I guess we don't need to use recruiters per se, mm. but I'm always open to that concept. If I'm ever approached by a recruiter saying, hey, would you be open to using a recruitment agency for for this i'd say yes but full disclosure we have a lot of resources yeah, so. okay. let's move on to um advertising you obviously work for career one yep uh, a lot of people would, would use your uh your company to, to post jobs mm-hmm. what attraction strategies should employers consider to get the best possible applicant pool so my first tip before anything else is understand the industry you're recruiting for the type of role what industry it's in I will use doctors and lawyers as an example. A generalist Australian National Job Board would not be your best channel for hiring doctors and lawyers or a CEO as an Mm -hmm. example. They're just not going to a job board and applying for jobs. They're not looking up doctors in Sydney. Mm. That's not very common. Not to say that they don't exist. There is always going to be a pool for that, but there are better channels and you're going to get better results, more volume and... Uh, better quality if you do research your industry those examples i use very often have very niche uh, i guess organizations and groups on things like facebook and whatnot that would be a place that i have heard recruiters talk to me about where they source from very successfully but in saying that wherever possible fish from as many pools as possible if you want to maximize your reach and get as much talent as possible exposed to you you want to go th- through as many channels as possible. So obviously in our space or my space, there is Seek, Indeed, Career One, Zuna, Jora, LinkedIn for some. Um, and I would also say that if it's not a job board at its core, yeah. it usually isn't going to be your first channel. But in saying that, if you've got the time, the energy, the resources, fish from as many pools as possible and then... Again, it's a case of how many candidates do you want to receive and how much time do you have to whittle that down to how many placements you need to make. So go where the candidates are. 100%. Basically. Exactly. Like marketing, Try to understand. Marketing 101, right? <laughs> yeah. Understand the industry, understand the candidates. So let's talk about um, the job ads itself. Mm-hmm. You know, these are the words that, that candidates are reading before they apply or before they consider applying can you give us some tips on positioning the role and also the organization so that way employees are in the best position to get that talent that they're they're after my number one tip is always look at what the experts are doing if you don't know how to write a job description maybe do some research on that look at what other people are doing when they write up a job advert and take away the good parts that you like but if i'm giving advice I would say make it as easy for a person to understand as possible. If you make it too wordy, if you make the formatting poor and it's very hard for a person to make sense of what they're looking at, then you're going to have that problem with quality. You're going to have that problem of people just applying because they're uncertain about what they're reading and what they're applying to at the end of the day. That's one of the actual core strengths of Career One. We've Mm. moved very much away from that text-based writer long job description We're trying to use technology to improve the process for everybody. We're really trying to streamline it, make it more visual as opposed to reading text. We're making it much more image-based, the information much more digestible. So a person can make a almost a snap decision on if this job's a good fit for them from key information being presented in a good format. Uh, Now, this may be a controversial topic, but I want to talk to you about the level of disclosure when you're advertising a role. And in particular, Things like salary, things like opportunity, things like flexibility. What is the level of disclosure 
that people should be posting? It should be posting as much transparency as possible. So I understand because I've been on both sides of the coin. I have been a recruiter and I have had clients that have said to me, we cannot disclose the salary. You cannot disclose the salary when advertising the job for me, etc." But as a person hiring for career one, mm. everyone who I interview, I'm very transparent about what is on offer, what the salary ranges are for every job title I have, what the potential commission earnings are, and what the, uh, I guess, the linear ladder is for promotion, for climbing the ladder, and all the intangibles as well. Wherever possible, I think that's going to save everybody a headache. It's going to, I guess, the process a lot smoother. So transparency, 100%, I would say. Salary, <laughs> uh, definitely exposed. Um, what about um, some other mediums to advertise jobs depending on your industry and your location, you know, whether it's regional or rural? Yep. Can you talk to us about some um, alternative mediums that employers can use to advertise these roles? Of course. So definitely social media platforms are a way for job hunters to find roles and industry specific niche job boards, location specific job boards. Uh, interestingly, let's say rural as the example, you know, they still very much use the classifieds model. There are definitely plenty of newspapers out there, news outlets out there that are still the primary source for people to find their next role. But I think as technology I guess, reaches those areas and I guess the players move into those spaces, I think they will move to a digital age also. Um, outside of uh, social media platforms, I would say whatever the uh, professional social networks are, whether they be specific groups, whether it be LinkedIn, it does depend on the roles very often. And like I mentioned earlier, I would say research these things, yeah. go and look into if you've got a role in a specific industry and a job title, look up what other people are doing in that space mm. and understand how the job hunters, put yourself in the shoes of the job hunter yeah, yeah. and understand what those people do. What are doctors yeah. doing? What are lawyers doing? Yeah. What are CEOs doing when they're looking for that next role? Yeah, because there's no point, I guess, creating a TikTok video if the candidates you're after <laughs> don't even use the platform. Exactly. Right? I, I want to ask you about you know the, the landscape that Career One operates in. It's a highly competitive landscape. How do you see it at the moment and where do you see it going if i'm being very honest about the job advertising industry it's in australia it's like no other country in the world um i'll take america as an example it's very very segmented and the number one player differs state to state in america mm. where as australia um seek is the incumbent in our market they have uh, the audience share and all the other players uh have their shortcomings career one included but that is the landscape today and a lot of advertisers out there are crying for change. They are asking, how can we shift this monopoly? How can we, um, I guess at the end of the day, have more options available to us? Mm. And that's what Career One is trying to do. Uh, I don't want to plug us too much, but we have built a completely different experience to the typical job board. Yeah. We believe that we have the best in class job hunting experience, that we've empowered our job hunters, our candidates with tools, technology, information that's just presented in a much more digestible format. And that's why I encourage people to take a look at if they want to mm. spur this change in our market and encourage change and competition, yeah. you do need to be fishing from multiple pools. You do need to support and back all of these additional channels. It's the only way that our, I guess, our talent pools can reach maximum yeah. efficiency and paul i don't know how much you can reveal but like what are what are the next steps for career one what are you guys working on <laughs> okay so the way i will give you our i guess our roadmap to some degree i can't reveal all of that uh, all that <laughs> yeah, yeah keep, keep some surprise <laughs> yeah but we launched the new platform the new job hunting experience in october of 2019 we were ready to i guess expose this to the job hunters, the candidates of Australia in 2020. Uh, we had received overwhelmingly positive feedback about the new experience that uh, it was helping job hunters uh, and, and empower them. Mm. And uh, we are more or less uh, having more conversations than ever before with potential clients and ones that have signed up with mm. us. So for us, our journey right now is to really get the word out there about that job hunting experience. And what I tell 
pretty much everyone I come across is I don't ask you to just believe me. Spend some time on all the big players, all the job boards, all of those sources where you will source talent from. Mm. And if you'd believe that Career One's technology and experience has the potential to be best in class, then it's worthwhile coming on board for that journey with us. That's where we're at. Selection. Uh, I'm super keen to know this. Like I, I talk about it with my team all the time. What is the role of cover letters? Is it still relevant or is it dead? Ooh. <laughs> That's a tough one. I'd say for corporates, definitely a still a live feature and it's something that is reviewed. But many recruiters, they do overlook a lot of cover letters and it's purely because very often a recruiter's objective is to show you candidates that are tried and tested, have done the job before mm. and don't really need a cover letter. They just need to show that they've done that job or have the right skills. Mm. Whereas a corporate and certain roles, don't get me wrong, have the ability for a person to really explain themselves. So I usually see a cover letter as somewhere where a person can put all of those things that are those X factors that aren't experience, that aren't skills mm. and tasks and KPIs that they've done before and achieved. This is where they really say, you should consider me because of these untangible, these things I can't really put on my resume. So mm. it really depends on the company. I always encourage everyone to tailor their cover letter and their resume yeah. to the roles they're applying to. I've seen some companies be really strict about it. Like they'll put, you know, we won't even consider you With if that. you don't include a cover letter. And we've tried that. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what, some of our best applicants did not have cover <laughs> letters. You know, when I asked them about it, they just said, well, I don't think it's relevant. My my experience is there. If you want to know more about me, put me through to an interview. And I, I have to agree with that. It's a case of, look, the cover letter is used as a, you should consider me because uh, I don't have the things you're looking for. Whereas very often the candidates that feel very confident that say, yes, I've got all of the mm. tangibles that you are looking for, like you said, if you want to know more about me on a personal level or all of those other X factors, let's have that chat. Let's have that yeah. interview. So I don't think cover letters are dead per se, and you can write in a job description on a, on a job listing, you know, you won't be considered without a cover letter, but realistically I'd say you wouldn't ever overlook a candidate that ticks all the boxes according to what your job description is asking for. What, what do you see as the role of skills assessment, psychometric assessments and background checks? How does that help an employer identify an outstanding candidate? So all of those different tests, those different analyses will give scope. Now, how they're used and interpreted really depends on the individual, the, the person hiring. Mm. You can get all the tests in the world and they can say, yes, this person's got a police check, this person's done the right psychometric test and they give you the information it's up to you to define how you're going to apply that if this person is a, a dominant driver if this person's a support staff so are those tests all valuable yes i would strongly encourage wherever possible to get as much information as possible more information is always going to help you make better placements mm -hmm. but if you don't use all of those tools effectively and all that information effectively, then it's worthless. So it's up to you how you implement them, but they are all valuable. Bit of advice now for uh, employers who, you know, might be in industries that get more candidates who may not have as long tenure in that specific industry because, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's a new industry or it's an industry that gets a lot of turnover. So they've got people who are transitioning careers, Yep. right? What, what are some tips you can give employers on managing those risks from a candidate who is transitioning careers into your industry? All of those things you mentioned earlier, like you can do some skills assessments to see what kind of soft and hard skills they, they hold and are those translatable to what you're doing? Um, psychometric testing that you mentioned earlier, that really does define um, very often what kind of employee this person's going to be and you should know what kind of employees you need for certain types of roles. Mm. So, of course, employment history is always going to be a tried and true methodology. This mm -hmm. person has done this job before. Yep. But uh, in terms of finding the best talent out there, you're always going to be better off if you can consider and have things in place to find talent that people wouldn't normally find. So doing those psychometric tests, mm. understanding a person's soft and hard skills. And there is a lot of technology out there, a lot of companies doing those things that offer those services 
when you're on that HR hunt, when you're trying to find that best talent. So you found the right person, you know, you've interviewed your candidates, you're like, I really want this person. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the key components to creating an attractive offer that makes it hard for the person to say no? <laughs> or, or, or better yet, makes it easy for them to say yes? I learned this in the world of recruitment. Understand what they are unsatisfied with in their current role or their previous role and understand what you're offering. So you need to know if what you're offering really solves the pain points they had. So it could literally just be money. That could be their only pain point and that could be the only incentive you have. Uh, but of course, as a business, you may want to consider the flexibility of uh, work hours, the ability to work from home, to so commute, the ability to, uh, if culture, if um, Friday night drinks is a thing that's a perk of your business and they're really into that thing, and that's actually a pain point of where they're at. You need to understand what your role and company and the career progression you're offering, if that really solves their problems. And that's the number one thing because very often, if they are currently employed, uh, they're going to be counted offered. And uh, hmm. very often you need to ask that question to that candidate. If you were counted offered, offered more money or whatever it is, would you stay there? And, and what are some negotiation strategies from an employer's perspective? Not from a candidate's perspective, because mm -hmm. our, our audience base is more HR or employer side. Yep. What are some tips you can give them? So very often the reason I have salary ranges is purely about what I think a person is capable of currently. Mm. And number of years of experience, industry experience, uh, what their current targets and metrics are that they're marked upon very much give me a guide of what I feel I can offer a person. So very often, let's say there is a salary range and I'm offering a person something more towards the lower end of that. It is purely because I'm saying to them, look, I think you're a great candidate, that there is potential, there is value to be had here, but you are missing skills or you haven't proven that you can do X, Y, Z. Mm. Now, I'm not saying this is going to be your salary forever, but let's set some clear expectations of what you need to achieve to be able to improve that salary and we'll review it in however long your processes are. If you've got a three-month, mm. six-month probation period, a 12-month one-on-one review, whatever it is, clearly lay those lines down just so that way everyone knows on the same page mm. and you, no one feels like they're being ripped off. Because yeah. when it's not done well, it can really unravel kind of in, in a recruitment <laughs> process. Like you can have an excellent advertising selection, interviewing experience and, and you get to the last stage mm. and then sort of just implodes because it's a topic that wasn't discussed earlier. Okay, so the last topic that uh, we want to discuss today is onboarding, offboarding. Why is it important to have an onboarding program or strategy? It really shows that you're a professional company to have something in place that's structured, that feels like, okay, this company isn't just haphazardly putting me into a role, that they know what they're doing, that there is a future here. So I would say every company needs to put some effort into their onboarding strategy, make sure that all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, that a employee feels like, okay, the first four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks of my journey in this company, this company knows what they're doing, that they've given me some real proper solid training, that everything is on point because I've seen many a company, especially small businesses, um, find great quality talent mm. and then for a person to just become very disillusioned very quickly purely because they just weren't organized enough. So plenty of resources out there for onboarding strategies, onboarding processes, all of that. Yeah. Um, we live in this age where information is at your fingertips. So yeah. whenever a question like that, if you're not sure what to do, Google it. There's plenty of information at your fingertips. In your opinion, like what, what are the key features that make an onboarding program? successful um i'd say clear definition of uh, what the training guide and what is expected um so for career one for example we do have a sales training manual mm. literally encompasses what the first four odd weeks at career one is going to be like what the expectations are what our methodologies are um, all of those things and it just gives a person when they leave that comfort to know okay this is what i should be expecting and this is what's going to be happening and i encourage everyone to have some kind of training manual of of, of kinds to ensure that people leave in a new role after their first day feeling okay i've, I've made the right decision I've, I've joined a good company these guys know what they're doing exactly. i'm in safe hands <laughs> exactly what's the role of offboarding offboarding should help 
close those goals, uh, sorry, those holes where you might have blind spots about why people are leaving your business, really. And uh, you should always be aware that you're not going to be able to retain 100% of your staff. People will leave for a number of reasons. It just closes that gap of why they left. And it also ensures that they leave on a good note, that they leave feeling like you are a professional company, you've done all you you can and you've given them a proper send-off very often those exit interviews can be a little bit awkward for a lot of companies mm. because their process just isn't strong they're, they're not done well and it really should be an exercise in going okay this is why this person left and is there anything we can do as a company to stop this from happening in future is there was it us as a company was mm. it them as an individual yeah. what were the reasons for them moving on because if it's done well and, and you retain a strong relationship with that employee that employee can always become an ambassador for the brand or, and they can always come back and work for the organization too right agreed to both uh yes a person who leaves on a good note will refer other people who are quality mm. to your company and if the stars align and the opportunity arises if they leave on a good note there's every chance they'll come back yeah because the opposite to that is obviously someone who leaves very unhappy and you know the the trend particularly with reviews is people are very quick to post something negative and it takes a lot of effort to actually post something positive so as humans we're very quick to <laughs> react when we when we want when we've got grievances of course look at any review on any company glass door um, just companies in general and the more uh, the, the more common scenario is that a person will leave a negative review when they have a bad experience as opposed to leaving a good review for a good experience it takes a lot more work for that so yes that offboarding process definitely important and making sure that people leave on good terms paul we've got the fast five questions for you now it's an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better are you okay for us to do this yeah go for it what was your first job my first job was a paper boy for my local area. Um, shout out to Pete and Nolene if you guys are still around. <laughs> um, I delivered that for about a year and made a lot of lifelong friends. <laughs> What's something interesting that's not on your CV? Am I allowed to say that I've known you for a very long time, Kai? <laughs> um, and that we used to break dance together many, many moons ago. That's not on your CV? <laughs> not on my CV, Kai. What advice would you give your 18-year-old self? Um, my advice to my 18-year-old self would be speak up when you know you're right. I think growing up in a culture where I was always, I guess, taught to respect my elders. Don't get me wrong, respect is a great thing. But there were times where I knew I had a better solution. I knew I was right. And by speaking up would have bettered the process, bettered the outcomes for everybody. But I chose to keep my mouth silent. And it took me a while to gain the confidence in knowing that, hey, I've got good ideas, I've got good solutions, and I should speak up about it. What book is a must read? I'm going to suggest The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. It's literally a book which has 48 different laws. A lot of them do con contradict each other, but they're very interesting on a level of if you don't know what you're doing to try and achieve certain outcomes, maybe this might give you some historic evidence of certain things people have done throughout history yeah. and how they've succeeded. Is that like an old book or is that like a new book? Has it been? It's been in circulation for many, many years. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been through many, many I guess, iterations. Um, definitely one that uh, is one of those almost self-help yeah, like books. I was going to say, okay, does it fall into that category? I'm interested in those books. <laughs> <laughs> What's a job for the future that doesn't exist today? Uh, definitely think of something technology related. I'm going to talk about um, something to do with 3D printing. I think in that space, we're still in its infancy. I'll talk about 3D printing sous chef because I know that they are making 3D printed foods to some degree and I think it's still very basic at this point in time. I think they made a steak recently, uh, but I think it's going to get a lot fancier. So that might be something that I, I all but see that being something that will exist. Never thought of that. <laughs> 3D printed sous chef. Like You just don't think of these things. That's why I love asking these questions because I'm like, what? Paul, so good to have you on the show. Cheers, guy. Appreciate being here. Our guest today was Paul Din, an experienced people manager, recruiter, and the head of sales for Career One, a leading Australian-based employment site that was established in 1999. In late 2019, Career One launched their new platform with one goal in mind, to enhance the job seeker experience using the latest tools and technologies. 
You can connect with Paul on LinkedIn and read some of the fantastic recruitment articles and resources. Thanks for listening to the HR Think Tank with Kai No. We'd love it if you could subscribe and share our podcast with your network. As always, the resources and links mentioned will be included in the show notes and posted on the Verify Now website, verifynow.com.au.